Good morning. Welcome to Troutman Baptist. Uh, I have a couple of announcements for you today. The poinsettia orders are due today and turn those into the office. Uh, we do have family grow uh, this afternoon at four here in the fellowship. Uh, we'll go out and uh, have an opportunity to write cards or go make a visit. Uh, it's welcome to anyone in the church. Uh, Laurie Clum Circle will be meeting at the church tomorrow at 6.30 to deliver the uh, shoe boxes. Um, our church family will come together for our annual Thanksgiving meal next Sunday at 5 and please bring a dessert to share. And finally, if uh, we'll be participating in the Christmas parade on December 2nd, if you would like to be part of that, please see Michelle today. Let's pray. Dan, Father, we're just so thankful for the day that you've given us. We thank for the many blessings, your love and your mercy and your grace. We're thankful for the men and women who uh, serve our country to give us the freedoms that we have. Or just uh, continue to watch over those who continue to serve and keep them safe. Lord, open our hearts uh, to hear your word today and that we may be able to share your love throughout the world. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand for the presentation of our flags and the national anthem. All right, you may be seated. We've come to a special time in our service today. Uh, being Veterans Day, we like to recognize and honor our veterans in our midst. Uh, and as it is our custom here at, at Troutman, uh, we're going to display the, the five branches of the military, uh, display the seals. Uh, Kim's going to play your theme song, and we've got some deacons that are coming, and we've got a gift we'd like to hand to you. Uh, so when your branch uh, is recognized, if you will please stand uh, so our deacons can get a little gift to you. And we will start off uh, with the Army. Kim? <laughs>
Marines. Coast Guard. and the Air Force. Thank you all to our men and women who have and are serving. Uh, also today, it's our special treat and honor to have retired Major General uh, James B. Mallory III with us today. He's going to bring a message a little bit later on in the service, but I wanted to go ahead and introduce him at this time. Uh, but let's prepare our hearts. Let's prepare our hearts to not only meet our Lord and Savior Jesus through his Holy Spirit, but let's worship him as well as we continue in our celebration, not only of our veterans, not only of our country, but especially of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ.
stand and greet one another this morning. Welcome any visitors we may have. Uh, once again, thank you for all you've done for us, and Lord, thank you for the opportunity to earn a living, and Lord, just give back what's already yours, that we may share your love throughout this world. I ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen.
at, the, uh, at that time, and interestingly enough, I don't know if you know the Tarmans up on Wallace Springs Road, but uh, Jen Tarman has a, an ancestor uh, who gave birth at Fort Dobbs. You know, I always thought they ought to probably depict that in some way. <laughs> but uh, anyway, um, the upshot is uh, that uh, that fort served its purpose. Uh, and then at the end of the French and Indian War, uh, people were moving on. This was becoming a settled area. And um, uh, gradually its timbers were used uh, to build a lot of people's homes. You know, you go to Rome and you see the Colosseum, you see all these buildings, they're very impressive. They're not nearly as impressive as they were because they all had marble on them. But uh, when uh, Rome fell, the, the locals took the marble off and put it in their houses. So all you see is basically the bones of those buildings, uh, not what they really looked like. And like those Roman uh, era buildings, uh, Fort Dobbs uh, became uh, the uh, uh, parts of some people's houses and some pretty good footings, you know, for uh, uh, foundations. So it's gone, but we were able to reconstruct. And uh, relatively few people, if you're new to Iredell County, I think it's important to know that uh, that patriotism runs deep for a reason. Um, during the Revolutionary War, uh, there were battles fought uh, in this county, uh, which wasn't Iredell County at the time, it was part of Rohan County. Uh, but uh, when Cornwallis was coming up uh, from uh, South Carolina after uh, Calpins and those battles, he uh, was hooking up to get around Charlotte, which uh, uh, he considered, uh, or described Charlotte as, uh, in Mecklenburg County, as the hornet's nest of the rebellion. Uh, and that's why we have the Charlotte Hornets. That's why when you look at Charlotte's uh, uh, little uh, shield or whatever, uh, they've got a beehive on there. And that's to remind us that uh, of Cornwallis's description. But uh, here in Iredell County, we had uh, that were organized by companies. And if you look at our townships today, those townships that we have, and this is Fallstown Township, uh, were originally named after the company commanders of those militia units. And so as those militia commanders would uh, uh, be replaced, then they'd change the name of the township. Uh, but it was a method of being able to organize a, uh, uh, a group of uh, ordinary citizens that would come together and defend uh, our community. It's one big, you know, uh, one over the world kind of thing. It was defending our own. Um, Moss was coming up. Uh, a large group of uh, uh, Tory militia were gathering uh, in Lincoln County. And they were, uh, you know, the, the American Revolution pitted settlers against settlers. Some were loyal to England, uh, they called them Tories. Others were not. They were loyal to the, uh, uh, to the state and uh, the uh, patriots. So, at the end of the day, uh, these, uh, uh, a group of uh, close to 400 uh, Tory militia were gathering uh, at a place called Ramsur's Mill in uh, Lincoln County. And uh, the militia here heard about that and uh, was trying to work with the militia because he wanted it to go before him as, as scouts and be able to figure out what he was going to run into. And so they uh, uh, jumped the gun. They didn't wait for his orders. They went ahead and assembled anyway. And uh, the folks over here found out about that. So they mustered their militia. And uh, one of my ancestors, Captain James Houston, was a commander of a uh, militia unit down at Center Creek, or Center Presbyterian uh, area down at Mount Morn. 
And so they decided, well, you know, uh, let's go to the sound of the guns. Let's, uh, let's try to, to uh, uh, cut them off. So they, they organized, they moved out very quickly. And uh, at the Battle of Ramsfors Mill, uh, they defeated that uh, Tory uh, militia and it was dispersed and it wasn't uh, of any use to Cornwallis. Interesting thing during the battle, um, everyone looked the same. They're all wearing the same clothes. So how are you gonna tell friend from foe? So the, the Patriot militia put uh, white cloth or cockades on their uh, hats so that they could tell who, who was who. Well, that's a good idea, except that it made a really good aiming point. <laughs> and so a lot of the casualties that the Patriot militia took were headshots, because <laughs> they were wearing a target on the top of their head. Uh, but nonetheless, they prevailed. Uh, Captain Houston, as a matter of fact, was, uh, uh, stabbed in the thigh with a sab saber, but he shot and killed the fellow that did that. Uh, but then they brought him back, they came back to Iredell County, uh, and pretty soon Cornwallis was uh, at the top, and uh, you may be aware that General Davidson, Davidson's named after, uh, mustered his troops to on the Catawba River. Uh, Cornwallis then marched across southern Iredell County. And back then, you know, armies lived off the land. They didn't have the, the, the provisions to take with them. So they confiscate whatever they could come across and uh, burn what they couldn't use. Uh, Captain Houston, who had been wounded recently, couldn't, couldn't, wasn't gonna be hanging around his house uh, so he had to go into a swamp uh, together with the, you know, the family silver, I guess, and uh, he hid out there. And it was left to his wife to confront a bunch of British soldiers who came through, burned her parents' home, and we were getting ready to burn hers, and she uh, remonstrated with the uh, British officer uh, that uh, they were conducting themselves very poorly and uh, convinced him to uh, get his troops in line and to move on. So their house didn't get burnt, but all their chickens and pigs got taken <coughs> and their corn. So uh, that happened right here in uh, Iredell County. Cornwallis, of course, went on to Greensboro fight it being fought along the way. Uh, he didn't have the benefit of a Tory militia going in front of him, kind of snooping and pooping and getting information back to him. So he ended up uh, with a bloody nose at the Battle of Guilford Courthouse. And then I better go back to Charleston and get reprovisioned. So he did. And then the next year he came up uh, looking to uh, hook up with uh, forces from the north and got cut off and trapped at Yorktown and the rest is history. Uh, a very improbable result. A small, colonial, bunch of ragtag uh, militias and uh, a small continental army uh, defeated the greatest uh, military power of that age. Uh, very improbable. Uh, so when you hear about, you know, uh, the phrase uh, manifest destiny, or American exceptionalism. Um, that's, that's not a politically correct way, but the reality is, um, you know, uh, God uses nations just like he uses us as people, and he uses you as a community of believers. He also uses nations, whether they realize it or not. Look back in the Bible to Babylon, the Roman Empire, uh, all of those were pagan empires, but God used them uh, for his purposes. Um, so I believe that God has used the United States of America. It's, you know, our expansion to the, to the Pacific Ocean is so improbable. I mean, who would have thought that Napoleon would decide to sell us uh, half the country <laughs> for a pittance in the Louisiana? Who would have thought that 
you know, uh, uh, Texas would declare its independence after and, and uh, then join the United States and then as a result of a general war with Mexico and 10 years later uh, join the United States and uh, add uh, the entirety of the West Coast. Um, you know, um, fairly improbable, but uh, God, ha God makes things happen when he has willing tools, and, and uh, that's what we have to be open to, is how is God wanting to use us? Now, we, we've talked about generally, you know, America as, as the uh, improbable nation, <laughs> and an experiment in a, in a constitutional democracy that didn't exist on the face of the earth. And we're the oldest democracy, constitutional democracy in the world. Um, we've survived a, two world wars, a cold war, a war on terror, depression, multiple recessions. We're like the Energizer Bunny. We can't take a lick and keep on ticking. Uh, but um, all of that is based on uh, not a loyalty to the soil, or to a tribe, but to a concept, to, to a constitution. The constitution is the, is the bones of our, our country, but the heart of our country is really the Declaration of Independence. And our founding fathers, in their wisdom, divided up our government into three separate branches and further subdivided another branch because they didn't want to have a dictator. They didn't want to have a king. They wanted to distribute power. And so you end up with a country that is extremely durable in terms of its government, but which is very ineffective and inefficient in how it gets about doing anything. And it's designed to be that. It's frustrating designed that way because our founding fathers in their wisdom figured that if you let any one individual or group of individuals have all the power, if you concentrated power, then uh, you would be then subjected to power and you would lose the individual freedoms that they fought. So that's why we have what it has. It's messy. It's, it's, it, it's, it's a terrible way to do business, except that it's the best way of all the other, even worse ways of doing business, <laughs> okay? Uh, but our founding fathers uh, uh, set out a, a, a playbook and a rule, a rule of law, and we believe in the rule of law, and that no person's above the law. And that includes Joe Biden and Donald Trump. Neither is above the law. And we have to recognize that. Because that's the foundation of this country, is a rules-based order. You know, God is not a God of chaos. He's a God of order. <laughs> uh, and we have rules and laws, and they're there to regulate our relationships in society. And you wonder where all these laws come from because there's a parcel of them out there. But basically they came from two sources. One was English common law. We took the unwritten common law of England and we wrote a lot of it down in statutes. But the other source of law, and, the, and you know it's been said that as, as a country we started out with a value system that was based on Judeo-Christian principles. And what does that mean? Well, words mean things. Judeo sounds like Jewish, Christian, probably related to what? Sounds like the Bible, the Old Testament and New Testament to me. Well, the bottom line was our founding fathers looked to the Bible for some insight into the kind of laws that would be appropriate to live by. Now, they didn't look so much in the New Testament because the New Testament doesn't have a lot of law in it. It talks about more important concepts like grace, redemption, and decision. 
But I don't know the Old Testament because it's the only place they knew of in all of recorded history where God laid out a bunch of rules and laws for a country to be governed by in ancient Israel 3,000 years ago. So our founding fathers looked in books like a little bit of Exodus and Leviticus and Deuteronomy because that's where the Mosaic law is in the Old Testament. Now, I know all of you are inclined to pick up a Bible and read through it as any good Baptist would be. But I don't think, I suspect, that Deuteronomy and Leviticus don't make anybody's top ten list of books of the Bible to read. And why is that? It's because it's the law. It's difficult to read. And quite frankly, it contains sacrificial rituals that we don't particularly relate to. Killing animals, sprinkling their blood on altars, eat this, don't eat that. And most people say, you know what? The New Testament says I'm not under the law. I'm under grace. So uh, I'm just going to read the, uh, you know, the Gospels and Romans. That's going to take care of me. Well, that's true, I suppose, as, as far as the most important issue of personal salvation. But to thoroughly understand the New Testament, you have to have read the Old Testament. Because, of course, what did Jesus mostly talk about? How he fulfilled the law and the prophets, which was all in the Old Testament, or which the only Testament. So that's where our founding fathers looked. They, and they picked out uh, a number of laws that we live by that are part of our legal code. It's just that nobody really remembers where they came from. You know, you start with the Ten Commandments, which is not a bad way for anybody to live their life. But a lot of the Ten Commandments are basically codified in many different statutes. Uh, they're just not referred to as the Ten Commandments. But that's where they came from. And our founding fathers created judiciary that incorporated the English system of interpreting laws. Our, our judges don't just apply the law, they interpret the law. So as society and culture changes, the law is always being relooked to make sure that it's relevant as, we, as our economy and as our culture changes. That's a different type of legal uh, jurisprudence than most of the rest of the world has. Most of the rest of the world has a code-based approach. Code-based approach comes from the Roman Empire. Uh, actually, you, go, you can go further back than that, but the, uh, Justinian, one of the emperors of Rome, came up with an entire legal system and wrote all the laws and said, these are the laws. And the judge would apply They wouldn't interpret the law. They didn't want to go crosswise with the emperor, apparently than he was thinking. So they just applied the law. That's all they do. So the law in code-based countries, and that's what most of the rest of the world has, because that Justinian's code was adopted in some form or another, even like by Napoleon, who came up with a Napoleonic code when he took over most of Europe. He did that when he was defeated. The code remained and that's where most European countries use, and China, and uh, most other countries. And in the code-based approach, judges apply, but do not interpret the law. So the law stays static, but ch culture and economy changes, and you end up with this tension between, you know, the uh, reality of living life and what the law tells you to do. And uh, so countries react to that differently. And different cultures do. I mean, uh, Germans, for instance. Germans generally uh, like order. They are rule followers, <laughs> all right? Uh, and so no matter how kind of out of whack the laws are, they'll continue to follow the law. Now, you can take that to an extreme. Six million Jews went into ovens with people that were following orders and not even questioning or contemplating the morality of those orders. 
But nonetheless, even the Germans after a while, it, you know, the rubber bands so far uh, in other societies earlier than that, they just can't take it anymore. And then what do you have? You have revolution. And then you have a new government come in and passes new laws. But then they stay the same. And you have this rinse and repeat, right? Well, we haven't had that because we've had a judicial system and laws that are flexible and get interpreted over time and, and take the steam out of that frustration. So, we have a unique experiment in terms of how we govern ourselves. And we are a beacon to the rest of the world. You know, Ronald Reagan said, we are a shining city and we need to look up and we need to uh, thank our God for the blessings that he's bestowed on us. But you know, he didn't bestow that for us to just use them up. He wanted us to share those blessings. And so, uh, as I said, I believe God uses nations. He uses countries. And I believe he's used America. Particularly, uh, it's been called the American century. And it's been called that for a reason. Because we're the in indispensable nation. We're the only nation that can actually get some things done. We need allies to be able to do a lot of things. But without us, our allies are not in a position to be able to accomplish what we can accomplish. 105 years ago, this weekend, uh, the guns fell silent following World War I. November 11th at 11 o'clock in the morning. Um, and that's why we celebrate Veterans Day. It was Armistice Day for many years. That was the war to end all wars. But after that war, we came back and we said, you know what, we don't want to get involved anymore. <laughs> We want to just take care of our own business. And so uh, we drew down an army to about 100,000. Uh, we we uh, cut up battleships and uh, our fleet. Uh, we uh, reduced our armed forces to the point where they were just a, they were a self-defense force. We had two big oceans that kept all those problems away from us until they didn't on December 7th, 1941. But in the prelude to World War II, for 15 years, we were in an isolationist mode. We didn't want because it cost too much. There was too much sacrifice of blood and treasure after World War I. They didn't want to do that. But during that time in the 1930s, you had uh, dictators, uh, consolidating uh, power in fascist regime, regimes that uh, by the late 30s had coalesced together with Germany, Italy, and uh, Japan and uh, invaded Poland in 1939. And even then, we trying to stay away, you know, we're trying to stay out of this thing. We didn't get involved in World War I until the Germans sank one of our cruiser, the Lusitania. Uh, but we tried to stay out of World War II. Battle of Britain's going on in 1940. Fall of France in 1940. Uh, and we're still, we're trying to, you know, let's try to keep away. Well, uh, we found out what happens when you aren't engaged, when you're not forward leaning. And the best defense is a good offense and a presence in those places that, if left alone, can turn around and bite us. So after World War II, that's the American century. We fought a 45-year-long struggle against communism. And that encompassed a war in Korea, war in Vietnam, uh, countless other little uh, third world country conflicts that uh, uh, we were 
opposing Marxism and communism. And uh, through persevering, uh, and you know, those of us from ever who, who who got a draft notice? <laughs> Anybody got remember getting a draft number? <laughs> well, that's how we that's how we uh, filled the army and the navy and the air force and the marines. We drafted folks. After Vietnam, we didn't draft folks any longer. We were still in the Cold War, but we went to a volunteer army, navy, air force, and marine corps. Um, Today, um, you know, well, in 1989, the Berlin Wall fell. In 1991, the Soviet Union imploded, and all those Eastern Euro European countries that had been under the domination of uh, the Soviet Union broke free from Poland to the Baltics to down to the Ukraine. And the Ukraine hadn't been free for 300 years. Since but that's, people want to be free. They want to... To, to make their own choices in terms of their economy and their culture. And uh, for 10 years, it didn't look like we needed to do much. We had a peace dividend. Our, everything got cut by about 40%. But we still had Russia with, uh, and China with nuclear weapons and North Korea constantly aggravating uh, the peninsula. So there's hot spots out there. But we generally, you know, the Balkans fell apart and we got involved in Bosnia. But, you know, we were keeping a lid on things all around the world. Uh, but uh, we cut in the 1970s our intelligence services and we went away from a human intelligence, agent-based, on-the-ground intelligence network to uh, eyes in the sky with satellites. And uh, as a result of that, we, uh, we missed the signals. And on 9-11, we found out that there was somebody out there that we didn't expect. We, you know, that came out of the blue for most Americans. Who are these people? Uh, so for 20 years, we were involved with uh, an active global war on terror and still are. But it's been successful. We haven't been attacked on our homeland. But uh, the ability to be involved in the world and to spend treasure and sacrifice the blood of some of our soldiers, airmen, and marines, um, that depends on young people joining the services because it's a volunteer army volunteer services. And you know, today, in World War II, one out of two American men wore the uniform. 50%. Uh, and everyone else was involved in the war effort. They were working in factories. They were producing food. Uh, they were growing victory gardens. Today, out of all the men and women between the ages of 18 and 42 who would be age-wise eligible to join one of the services, only 25% meet the minimum requirements in order to enlist. One of them could join if they wanted to because they don't meet a number of criteria. Maybe they don't have a high school diploma or they... Uh, uh, have got a GED, but they don't score high enough on the aptitude test, or they are uh, physically uh, not able to uh, meet minimum requirements, uh, or uh, they're on uh, uh, medications for asthma or for ADD or ADHD. Look, I'm ADD. <laughs> I just didn't know what it was when I was growing up. <laughs> but uh, the upshot is... Um, you know, it's only a very small percentage of Americans that could enlist if they wanted to. And at the end of the day, only 1% of that total wears the uniform. I'll circle back to Iredell County. We have strong junior ROTC programs in 
four of our five high schools. The only reason we don't have it in a fifth is because the Defense Department won't spring for the dollars. Say, so you got more than most people. <laughs> you know, we need to spend our dollars elsewhere. In Arnold County, the last figures I had were that instead of a 1% where of our high school graduates wearing the uniform, it's closer to 3%. So three times the national average. And that's because of who we are. And what's been passed down from generation to generation in terms of service to our country. Now, where does that all fit in God's plan? I believe God uses not just individuals. I think everyone here can say, yep, the commission is our mission. It's to share the gospel, to share the good news. Uh, and we, d- are in, or we are exhorted to do that individually and collectively as a church, as brothers and sisters in Christ. And we also uh, depend on our country You know, we have a worldwide mission to evangelize. But how do you get missionaries in foreign countries? They have to be allowed to be there. And to be allowed to be there, the government has to really be a rules-based type of government. We can't get into Muslim countries. And you don't see too many missionaries going to China or Russia, or Iran, or North Korea. They're not there because the governments don't want Christians. They don't want missionaries because that's a threat. Uh, That's why our country is the indispensable nation because but for America being out there willing to sacrifice then many of the countries that we do operate in for our international missions or the International uh, Mission Board of the Baptist Convention, Southern Baptist uh, that you support through your Lottie Moon offerings, or the Gideons uh, who you know, have a worldwide you know, presence in many countries just passing out New Testaments and Bibles because like God says in uh, Isaiah chapter 55, you know, his word goes out and, and, it, and it accomplishes the tasks that he has designed for it to do. And our job is just to get it out. So the challenge for you all is how do you put legs on that? How do you actually get out beyond these walls? Because he calls us together to worship. And that's to fill up our gas tank so that we can then go out and make a difference in the world. And as a country, if we weren't out there, then we wouldn't be able to get into many more countries. It gives us opportunities to support folks that... I know in Iredell County that are in Peru or the Philippines, or, um, Colombia, uh, Japan, uh, the Middle East. And we've got missionaries all over the place, just from Iredell County. Uh, but how can you make a difference? Well, we all have to share the gospel. Now look, I, I am not an evangelist. <laughs> okay, That is not my... I can't go up to people, cold call, you know, just sort of start talking. That's just not that's just not my personality. But all of us have a comfort zone. All of us are experts in something that, you know, you know people and you are comfortable to be able to share with them about your family and your friends and other things, and they're able to see <coughs> that you have a different outlook on life and you're able to share that comfortably. So 
but it's still it's hard to figure out because we're we're all so captured in our you know our uh, media <laughs> that we're not out on a routine basis. Well, uh, 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 the, the great thing about Iowa County, we are so blessed to live in this little corner of the world. There are so many opportunities out there for all of us to be involved in some way to make a difference in people's lives and share the gospel at the same time. Uh, you know, for veterans, you know, we have the Piedmont Veterans Assistance Council. That's a group that, that tries to meet a need uh, that, that nonprofits aren't meeting and the VA isn't meeting, government isn't meeting. You know, uh, so homeless veterans was an issue. Uh, and a result of, of being able to leverage other nonprofits and get Fifth Street Ministries that understood how to run a uh, shelter based on authority that had property, and the Veterans Assistance Council that understood how to qualify folks. They're able to get a, a, a veteran's transition home so that you could take a person that had uh, lost their way or lost their ability to uh, support themselves and get them through a process where they got back on their feet and then they could transition into jobs and uh, being on their own. And, and that was just happened locally. Um, there are so many different organizations out there that, that help children. Um, you know, and this is where I, I, I can't remember it all, so I didn't want to forget them. But um, yeah, I'm not even sure where that is. Yeah. Um, I mean, you think about uh, for our children, good news clubs. Who's heard about those? That's Child Evangelism Fellowship. You hear all this stuff about, oh, you know, all these things are being taught in the schools. Not, not, I, you know, yeah, I'm sure that's being taught someplace on the left coast, not in Iowa County. <laughs> you know, we have uh, dedicated volunteers, Christians who through Child Evangelism Fellowship run good news clubs in all of our elementary schools. And these are ministering to children who's, who are not going to church, whose parents aren't churched. Uh, we have Boys and Girls Club. Not, that's, not, that's, that's, a, that's not a religious focused organization, but you're helping children lead and you're helping, get, helping them kind of focus on getting their life together in terms of their values and how to, how to be successful. It's a very easy thing to do to share the gospel along the way. Uh, you can do that directly. If you, know, if you like athletics, power cross making a tremendous difference in the lives of a lot of young people that just don't have any other uh, kind of uh, role models to, uh, to, uh, to emulate. Um, Pregnancy Resource Center uh, has, a, has a, another uh, uh, ministry within it called Truth Girls that's in all of our high schools. It talks with one young women about, hey, these are choices that you know, you're, you're you have in life and some of the, the pressures they're under and helps them work through those issues. Uh, Young Life Ministries have been doing that forever. You know, you gotta meet people where they are. And if they need to hear about Jesus, they're probably not sitting in here, <laughs> right? They're someplace else. So we have to go where they are. And each of you has a comfort level in certain terms of something that you are comfortable doing. And I'd su suggest you just find out what, you know, what you know, really is on your heart, what motivates you, and then find some of these nonprofits that all are looking for volunteers. Uh, they're looking, obviously, but they're also looking mostly for volunteers. They need people that can put you know, legs and on what the services are that they're delivering. Uh, so, to, to sort of uh, wind up my minute, uh, I'll just say that we are, we're called 
by God. We are commissioned by Jesus to share the gospel. And uh, we've been blessed beyond measure. If you've seen how the rest of the world lives, uh, you have no, we have no conception of uh, how well we are. And you can hear all kinds of things that can be a downer. And we can be think the world is coming to an end. But we need to get out of those negative, reinforcing, you know, fear is just, you know, it's like Franklin Roosevelt said, we have nothing to fear but fear itself. We need to focus on Jesus and what he wants us to do. And to do that, you can't be unable. You got to be getting up and doing something. So, uh, with that exhortation, uh, I just uh, want to thank you for supporting our veterans. Because that sends a strong signal to this community about what this church is about, what you individually. Uh, but we need to take the next step. And we need to follow that uh, path, ever how God has laid that on your heart. So I'll conclude by saying, may God bless America. And God bless our veterans that have served to pr protect us. And God bless you for all that you do to advance the gospel. Amen. Thank you, James. Well, we're going to close our service, conclude with a, a melody, and uh, Michelle's going to, going to bring that uh, as usual. Uh, I'm down front. If you would like prayer, uh, volunteers, we are called to go out. And as my invitation uh, many Sundays is a challenge to, to one, you know, do you know this Jesus? Have you met this Jesus? You understand that calling. But yet, as God may be calling you, I know he's in the calling business, uh, calling us to go, to, go, to volunteer. If you have questions of what it is, some of these resources that James just talking about, uh, come and we can share w with you uh, some of those resources. Maybe God's calling you into full-time ministry, into ministry itself, vocational ministry. I'd love to talk with you, but let's stand and let's continue worshiping, close our service by singing this medley. Thank you.